Uh, by way of disclaimer, I'd like to start out by saying that I'm not going to talk about ancient economies. Rather, I'd like to take the idea of economies into the medieval world, into the Islamic world of the <coughs> uh, Near East. And to begin with this, I'd like to focus, first of all, on some images of the Middle East. First of all, one associates the Middle East with camels, and of course, there are indeed camels, lots of camels in the Middle East. But the flip side in those camels is that we have cities. And cities actually continue to this day, marked by, by domes and minarets, just as we see on the uh, pack of cigarettes. This is part of the reality of the Middle East. And indeed, what I'd like to focus on is that the economies of the Islamic world are really marked by an intense urbanization in the medieval and indeed into the modern period. And that these cities are really the primary engines of economic development in these periods. <coughs> I will refer uh, periodically to the, very, the wonderful presentation by Emmanuel Myers a couple of weeks ago, and he showed the extent of the Roman Empire. Here's the extent of the early Islamic Empire, if you will, the Caliphate, uh, which stretched from Spain into Central Asia, and indeed uh, in the north in uh, to uh, um, Eastern Africa as well. My work has been primarily concerning cities, and uh, I, this is a product of one of my professors, Paul Wheatley, who wrote a magnificent volume, uh, The Places Where Men Pray Together, about the early Islamic city. And the upper view here shows one of the maps of this book, where he is discussing uh, textile production throughout the Islamic world. I'll just show this to get an idea of the intense urbanization of the cities throughout this region, which, which marked this uh, uh, caliphal empire. The lower illustration comes from uh, Robert Adams, my other professor, my major professor, who discusses the rise of cities. And we can see from the fourth millennium uh, the gradual rise of cities. But then over the long period, we have a dramatic increase, which really accentuates in the Byzantine and early Islamic periods to a great uh, mass of urban life. And then, uh, after the Crusades, some disagree. I wouldn't take that part uh, terribly seriously. OK, one of the images also of the cities is the marketplace. And one th thinks of these marketplaces as uh, very crowded and perhaps dirty. But in point of fact, markets continue. And indeed, this is a market from in Aleppo uh, very recently, where you have a shop with textiles and dresses to be made. And here's another shop, uh, which I found wonder quite wonderful, uh, stuffed animals with the family looking on uh, at this display. But the traditional uh, market consists of these uh, dukans, these shops, the shop is open to the public. The, the merchant will sit there and show the wares in an outer area and then have storage facilities in the uh, inside rooms. So this is the basic image. Um, now, Meyer's fine presentation uh, began with and discussed mainly the Roman economic system. I'd like to caution you, however, that the Roman system is very different from the Byzantine system. Uh, <coughs> in the cities of late antiquity, then, bef before the rise of Islam, had already begun to change drastically. Um, historians and archaeologists are now in a fierce debate about whether this 
Late antiquity was a period of decline or continuity. In point of fact, we have the writings of uh, Julian of Ascalon, who in the sixth century wrote a uh, treatise about cities of the Byzantine world, which was basically a building code, where he was laying out um, the distances where you could have uh, workshops, where uh, the width of streets, um, what industries could be in town and outside of town, um, and where street, where uh, doorways might be placed and not placed. Uh, and the reason why Julian was writing this um, was in point of fact because cities had begun to change, and he was worried about the decline of the city. This uh, treatise was taken up by one of my students, uh, uh, Tracy Hoffman, who wrote her dissertation concerned, concerning the changes of cities in Ascon, of all places, and she is continuing, actually, with those excavations uh, to this day. Um, so, so let me go back and exp explain that. Yes. Okay. One of the things that uh, Myers uh, discussed was the streets with the colonnades along the streets and the shops along those streets. And see, this continues into the early Islamic period. For instance, this is Anjar in southern, in eastern Lebanon, where you have a new city laid out in the early Islamic period. In the beginning of the 8th century, one has this town laid out. It's very much a classical town with a tetrapolitan in the center, a cardo and decomenus crossing main streets with colonnades and shops all along the streets. Off of the street is a mosque. Here's the mosque just off the main street and the palace complex of the governor just uh, behind the mosque. The central elements there of an Islamic city. These cities changed over time, and for instance, you have the classical thing. This is the wonderful illustration of Jean Sauvager, who in the 1930s was stud studying Laodicea, Laodice. And what you have is the classical street with its shops, and the colonnade, sidewalks, and the main wide street for cart carts and delivery of goods at night. We didn't have any trucks walking up their streets, the deliveries were all made in the dead of night. In the Byzantine period, Sauger recognized that already this is breaking down, and shops are starting to be built onto the sidewalks, and occasionally into the street proper. By the Islamic period, this process has uh, accentuated because basically you're no longer using wheeled vehicles. And so you, the need for a big, wide street is no longer there. So the big, wide street becomes a whole uh, different solutions, where you have two streets, sometimes two streets with a major shops in the center, sometimes even three streets. So these are the permutations of the classical city over time. This is not to say, now is this the common? No, the, probably not. This is because this is still a vibrant economic system. Rather, this is a different way of organizing space. And I believe I can show you this in a number of examples. For instance, here we have Palmyra in northern Syria. And we know about the classical city laid out, uh, Diocletian especially, uh, reorganized the classical city with its Hippodamian uh, plan. Notice here that in the late Byzantine period there's what they call an Episcopal group, that is an area where there are several churches and bishops' residences, etc. This is the Christian center of the city. And just beside that, one has apparently the beginnings of the Islamic city. Laid out beside the Christian, you have a new Islamic center, and it was only a few years ago that Dini Jenakan, a very fine young archaeologist, has discovered the remains of a mosque 
And here you have the shops of the early Islamic period and actually going back into the Byzantine period. So these are not Islamic, but rather they started in the early Byzantine period. Here's a view of these shops along the street heading toward the mountain just here. So you have here in Palmyra a, a graphic image of this change from the Byzantine into the early Islamic period. Let me give you another example. Here you have Beth Shan in the Jordan Valley opposite Pella. You have this important uh, archaeological site excavated from the 1930s on and more recently by Hebrew University and the Israeli Antiquities Authority have done very extensive excavations. One of the things they found was you had the main street here going to the theater. This is the heart of the town, uh, just at the base of Tel Bashan, where, with its many different uh, periods. And in the late Byzantine period, you have a, a church at the very top there. But in the Islamic period, there was a very small mosque here, and this area was developed uh, by the Muslims. And just along the street, Savannah so Street, as they, they call it, they discovered a new souk, a souk which was built up in the early Islamic period. And we know that because we have an inscription done in mosaics that the king of Hisham paid for this new uh, marketplace in, in the town. And this, this market has now been uh, restored by the Israel Antiquity Authorities of this early Islamic souk as part of the whole complex of this wonderful archaeological site. I'd like to concentrate today, though, on uh, Egypt. And Egypt, this is my rendition of the archaeological remains of earliest Egypt before and after the conquest, the Muslim conquest. And what you have is the Muslims set a new town, a, a new center, next to the older fort. The older fort was called Babylon, ironically. And it is a, a typical late Byzantine uh, fortification. And this was invested by the Muslims for a number of months before they were able to capture it. Actually. Uh, they, they capitulated and allowed the Byzantine army to leave, uh, and they went to Alexandria. And then the Muslims built next to that their own uh, settlement, which was called Fustat, focused on the mosque of Amr. Amr ibn Abbas was the commanding general who took Babylon and hence captured Egypt. So this is the focus of uh, the new settlement of Muslims next to the older uh, Babylon. And these are the excavations which have taken place, mainly American excavations under George T. Scanlon and earlier excavations under Ali Bagat and Gabriel, who um, uh, worked in the 1920s. What I'd like to talk about, first of all, though, is Babylon, because this fortification continued under the Muslims, and what happened there is ex extremely interesting. Because that town was the administrative center for the Byzantines for Egypt. In, at this apex of the delta, the capital, of course, of the country was Alexandria, but this was a primary center, and this, this Fort was the locus for all of the administrative decisions and the taxation for much of Egypt. And that continued under the Muslims. The Muslims left this town, this fort, intact. In fact, um, the, the fort itself had um, a large population, Jewish population, Coptic population, and they stayed in place, and in fact, uh, it's quite interesting that these ethnic, multi-ethnic communities live side by side. In point of fact, um, it wasn't until about the 10th century that Muslims started to live within this area. And Copts, the 
Christian Egyptians lived throughout the whole, and actually started living in the first state, as did the Jewish population. So it was a thoroughly mixed population, but it was focused on Babylon, this old fort. Within the old fort, there were two synagogues. And the, the, the synagogue, more famous synagogue, which I visited years ago, um, very decrepit state, and has since the peace um, it has been completely restored. Some excavations were done on this, and we now have the Ben Ezra uh, Synagogue, which is the Palestinian synagogue of um, Fustat, in which uh, Maimonides uh, uh, taught for some years. Uh, this uh, important synagogue um, was uh, key to uh, the administration of Egypt and uh, the mercantile life of this early Islamic city. Now, what's interesting is that this synagogue also contained tr a treasure. The treasure was uh, revealed in the late 17th century and 18th century that there was a Geniza there. Geniza is a very interesting term. It means treasure, and indeed it's a very old term. Ganj is the Persian equivalent and means treasure. But it's a treasury, a place that something important is stored. In this case, there was an upper room. I'm told that it was just up in this area here. There was a closed room with a, an upper hole in it. And within that, documents which happened to have the name of God. If a, if a document began in the name of God, with a bismillah. Um, they were, uh, that document could not be destroyed, but was rather saved. And so over the centuries, that room filled up with documents, thousands and thousands. In the early 18th century, this was discovered, and um, this material was thrown out. And merchants suddenly discovered these things, antiquities dealers, and these documents were sold by the bag load virtually bags and bags of these medieval documents, were some dating from the 11th through the 13th century. And I showed just one, a very simple one of these documents. They're very interesting because they, the script is Hebrew. These are the documents of the Jewish community. They're written in Hebrew, but the language is Judeo-Arabic. And so this is a, it's a, a form of Arabic which they were speaking in that time, and that's the language which has been uh, uh, written with this. These letters were collected and distributed. Philadelphia has a large collection. The vast majority, however, are in Cambridge. And one of the earlier collectors was uh, uh, Solomon Schechter. And here is Schechter. This is not the early Oriental Institute, but this is actually in Cambridge University. And he is shown with some of the, these horrible fragments of text, of, of text written on paper of the medieval period. And he started organizing these. And his work was taken up by Goitain. And Goitain, who was attached with uh, Princeton, for many, many years, studied, indexed all the information found on these uh, letters. Thousands and thousands of them. Uh, one shows to think how many index cards he must have had at the end. He put together all this information in six volumes, of which these vo uh, volumes detailed the society of Fustat Cairo and uh, its economic underpinnings. Indeed, his first volume was called The Economic uh, Foundations for this community. And what you have in these letters, then, is a full documentation of 
Arab and Jewish community, its interactions with Muslims and Copts, and Great Time stresses from the first volume throughout every volume, whether he's talking about uh, social interactions, the family, whatever, that basically the pattern he sees in this Jewish community is very similar and can't be thought to be too different from the Muslim or Coptic communities also living in this same uh, city. But for our purposes, I'd like to stress that these uh, documents were extremely interesting and important for details of the economics, the economic system of medieval Cairo from the 11th through the 13th centuries. And so what you have are details of the industries, the manufacturing processes, the market conditions and prices, and business practices. And among the latter, we have detailed information about the techniques used by these merchants, systems of credit, partnerships, especially the important commenda of the medieval period, and legal cases, as these things went awry and were brought before judges, and also government uh, regulations and rights, and of course, taxes. And so we have the documentation of all these materials. What's interesting about this is that it reveals that uh, the government pretty well laid, uh, kept hands off of the mercantile system. Certainly one had judges, qadis, who uh, adjudicated uh, problems. And likewise, there were muqtasibs, market inspectors, uh, within the town proper. But basically, there was no sense of a municipal government getting in the way of uh, these merchants, which is very, very interesting. Rather, there were, there was a whole system also of middlemen, Dalal, who functioned as brokers in this uh, system as well. The importance of these letters shows that one of the key factors for medieval commerce was the intense interaction across the Islamic world revealed in uh, the information exchanged. Information was extremely important, and one has letters about prices, commodities, what's available, what's a good price, instructions for middlemen, what to buy, what not to buy. And these, uh, there's a whole set of these letters which are pertinent to the India uh, trade. And Goitain, I once calculated every 10 years he promised a book on the India trade. And unfortunately he died before he actually did, but his uh, um, student actually has very recently come out with such a book. On the other hand, there's a whole set of letters detailing relations with Mediterranean, with Sicily, and as far as Spain as well. Wherever there were Jewish communities, one had an interaction exchanging economic information for commercial practice. Okay, what this means archaeologically is that if you look at Fustat area archaeologically, one sees the excavators here, one knows that was, there was a main, main street going along the Nile called the Souk of Azam. And then another street going to Yashkur, which is the Ibn Tulum Mosque of later medieval period. One of the areas that Scanlon excavated actually uh, out uh, here in the eastern portion was just a little street, but it shows a whole series of shops along the street. And this dates exactly to the same period of the Geniza texts. And so here we have a physical manifestation, and what you find in one of the storerooms is a whole uh, series of amphorae. So these amphorae are dated from the 11th or 12th century. So the amphora, as a uh, uh, ceramic form, continues into the medieval period, and indeed amphorae are known into the autumn times as well. So uh, please, uh, to slightly correct uh, Emmanuel Meyer's presentation, he mentions amphorae as primary uh, containers for oil, wine, and garum, that is this fish paste. In point of fact, uh, amphorae were used 
for many, many other things as well. Think of the employee weather as your early cardboard box. You can put anything in it. Uh, and for me, I have been found with, with sweet meats, uh, breads, sometimes nuts and fruits. Uh, indeed, uh, some amphorae from southern France actually had clay stuffed in them, you know, special clay for making a special kind of pottery. You could put anything in, into an amphora. The key of the amphora was that the shape was specific for loading into the hold of a ship. So it's a specialized container, uh, it's sort of a container uh, trade, much as we have now with our big metal boxes. They had M40 for the same purpose. Now, for instance, with this international trade, uh, we have this maritime trade, and here are the excavations of the site of Sergi Lamani, located off the southern coast of Turkey. This again dates to the 11th century. Again, we're talking about the same time period. And uh, George Bass excavated uh, this fairly well-preserved ship, which was filled with glassware. The primary content was glass. The glass, including color, that is uh, raw glass for manufacturing, was apparently being taken from somewhere in Syria, uh, north possibly to uh, Constantinople for reworking in the Byzantine world. And so one has this, and in the whole of the ship we have a series of M40. And I'm curious enough, these little things which are glass weights. Apparently these glass weights, which were officially issued by the uh, Muslim governments, Islamic governments would issue these little things, and each merchant probably had a little set for himself to check the veracity or check on the coinage, which was uh, wildly erratic as far as its weight. So each merchant was able to check the, the quality of the coins that he had to accept with these little weights. This suggests on this uh, sh ship that indeed, although it was probably a, a large official uh, um, consignment from a uh, large distributor, there were probably uh, individuals who were engaged in individual trade on this ship. What it suggests is that this trade, which was highly monetized, um, spread throughout the world. There was uh, the Islamic world into its uh, fringes in, uh, involving Europe and the Byzantine world as well. In a sort of late Pax Romana, that is under the Caliphate, the, the trade was ex extensive. And I should point out that from the earliest Islamic period onward, the attitude toward commerce was very different. One has to remember that Muhammad's profession was a trader. He himself mounted caravans who, uh, that went into uh, Syria. He, is known to have gone to Syria a number of times from uh, Arabia. So from the beginning, the merchant actually had an elevated status within the uh, Islamic uh, social system. But the aspect which I think is fairly important uh, to remember. Let me uh, add a slightly personal note as far as this mercantile trade. Uh, this is uh, a section from my own excavations in Aqaba in southern Jordan. And here we discovered a, uh, along the beach we found a series of shops. Here you have the original town wall with its towers. And one of the towers, there's a tower here and a gate. And this tower here, unlike the other horseshoe or U-shaped towers, were square. as an anomaly which I uh, immediately focused my attention and I looked at it and sure enough the older, original early Islamic tower had been converted into a shop. And so within this, and here it is, in the upper level, which is at this point removed, there was a series of bins in the back and it sails away out and in the front. Indeed, we subsequently found a whole series of shops along the beach. Perhaps this is where trading, when the ships came in, they initially traded with the ships 
on the beach here, or perhaps these were tourist trinkets for people enjoying the beaches. We're not sure. But indeed, um, this is then a reflection of the economic activity of this place uh, along the Red Sea coast, and indeed uh, involved with this Indian Ocean trade indirectly. Let me return then to Cairo. Up until now, I've been talking about Fristat here in the southern portion. The Mosque of Amr is just here. Over the centuries, Cairo moved in stages northward. Until the last stage of the late 10th century, a new town was laid out here, which was known as Al-Qahura, from which we have our name, Cairo. Al-Qahura here was originally a royal sector for the Fatimid uh, sultans here. And you had the two palaces and a main street. That main street became the focus for the medieval city of the Fatimid through the late Fatimid, Ayyubid, and Mamluk occupations. That is, from about the 11th through the 13th centuries. You have this being developed as the main portion of the city of Cairo. And what you have here is a wonderful study by Andre Raymond, who uh, discusses this main street and then the commercial system around that street. The street is known as Ben Ghasrain to this day. This is a main thoroughfare in Cairo. Ben Ghasrain means literally between the two palaces. The palaces are long gone, but the commercial network remains. And what we now found is that this, this was full of shops, and the merchants lived in the communities on either side, uh, further away from where they actually were. This is a very different system from that of the Roman period, which we've already heard about. I'd like to turn to another city of the Islamic world, which is, makes this pattern perhaps even clearer. We have the study of Aleppo in northern Syria, done by John Savaranger, and he, uh, very interestingly, discovered here the Byzantine city. This is the extended Byzantine city, which is, doesn't really encompass all of the Hellenistic walls. And here's the Kahlani, the citadel, which is left high and dry, not really uh, uh, occupied. And uh, you have them, this is the Byzantine uh, city. In the Islamic period, this expands enormously. The whole area is infilled. One has the, the whole of the old walled area filled in with occupation, with the uh, streets and, and communities here. The Hara Yahud is mentioned by Raymond. Uh, no, this is Raymond. Is it Raymond? This is Denmark. Uh, study, the Hara, of course, this is the Jewish quarter. So there's a large Jewish quarter in this sector of the town. And then the town from the various gates expands out into suburbs, uh, expanding beyond the walls in the late uh, Islamic period. What I'd like to focus on here, though, is the Medina. Medina is a French term, uh, sometimes used the other term, Caspa. Uh, Caspa comes from Casaba meaning town, and Medina, of course, means city. What they're talking about is an inner city, a focal axial city, which is characteristic of all medieval Islamic towns. Let me show you what this is reconstructed. This is the Medina of Aleppo. Not the biggest in the world, but certainly one of the most elaborate. And what you have are the souks. The classical city had this main street with a single row of shops on either side. Look at this. We have one, two, three, four streets packed with shops, thousands of shops. 
shops in this area, and extending inward, as far as you can see. And so you have the main souk, is this intense occupation. This is the reason for the city, is this trade. And this trade, of course, is retail of various goods, uh, segregated by commodity. You have a souk of uh, textiles, well, several souks of textiles, actually. You would have uh, another souk for metal work, for shoes, etc. And these are all grouped around the main mosque. This is the Great Mosque, uh, which is a focus for the communal activity, obviously, convenient for midday prayers and other prayers uh, by the populace uh, inhabiting and trading in the souks proper. But also right about it, it's part of this uh, city proper, you have these structures, these large buildings with shops and around a cent open central area. And these within the cities are called khans. That is, these are trading. So you have larger ones here and here, and then smaller ones too. Some of these khans are very carefully protected. They have a, you know, they can be locked at night, and they are for more important uh, goods. They're called glycerias um, or bellstones. That is, these are for important valued goods, jewelry, fine textiles, the like. And of course, gold would be in these special glycerias. The homes, however, these larger establishments, are actually geared toward the wholesaling trade. That wholesaling merchants would bring their goods in quantity and store them in these uh, large halls. Strangers and the merchants would live in the upper stories of these halls. So they functioned also as hotels for um, strangers uh, to this city. And therefore, you had the wholesaling establishments beside the retailing establishments uh, round about. And of course, the devils, the brokers, would be extremely important in making this whole system work. And we shift it to another city. This to, in the east, this is Esfahan. And Esfahan has undergone many changes over time, but it's a very important uh, oriental city. And so we have originally one had a large maidan or open area for trade, next to which was a palace, and adjacent to it would have been the mosque. Here the Masjid Jali, the Friday mosque, or the Congregational mosque is a better translation, um, adjacent to this trading area. And one can imagine that there would have been souks around this area. This is from the uh, 9th through the 11th centuries. So basically, you have this. As you can see, it's been urban railed. I mean, it out of existence now. There is still a, a square here with the, the streets going into it, but that's about all one has now. In 1500, the Safavids came to power, and the Safavids uh, reestablished uh, Esfahan as their capital. The Safavids, of course, ruled from the 16th through the 18th century, contemporary with the rise of the Ottomans, at which they were at heads. Um, but with whom they also traded. And so here's the old Masjid Jani, and the old Maidan is up in this area. The Safavid Shahs uh, established a new town to the southwest. And you have here a complex of palaces, uh, known generally as the Makshid Jahan, that is the map of the world. Apparently, one of the buildings had a map describing all the regions of the world. Beside it was the Jahara Bank, a series of elite residences of, of merchants and powerful individuals. Along the Jahara Bank, that is the four gardens. All well, this was intensively gardens with wonderful houses stretching across the river here and adjacent to Jofar. Jofar was the Armenian community, very important uh, mercantile community, a Christian community established right beside 
uh, these elite residences. Notice that the, the, the palace, as it were, and the fortress is off to the side. It's not really important. What is focal, however, to the town is this area, the Great Maidan, with the new mosque, the masjid -e shah And so, for instance, we have an 18th century depiction of this complex. Here, the Aigapu, the um, area where the Shah could watch uh, the activities in the Maidan, and his palace is behind that. Opposite is the Falakhan Zan uh, Mosque, and you can see that the whole of the Maidan is filled with merchants uh, actively uh, trading. This was the main activity with the mosque, the main Masjid Shah, again peripheral to all of these activities. This is also known as the Polo Wars, and indeed there may have been polo matches here as well for the Shah to look at. About uh, four years ago, I took this picture of the Lutfari Khan Zarab, this, this wonderful mosque, and you can see the shops in the front. Um, this is uh, still a souk, a market area, with uh, stalls inside protected and uh, trading for local commodities, but also tourist trade as well. Uh, this has been a very popular place for tourists, as you can see from the collapses of these carriages. The other focus in this was we know that there were numerous halls and these uh, establishments, just like in Aleppo, or indeed virtually anywhere in the uh, Islamic world, you had these structures. Here, a very ornate uh, entryway. Uh, and this continued in, in the interior. You have here the shops and then uh, temporary stalls in the center. Really, this is for these uh, wholesale activities of very large uh, merchants. And these would have been inhabited by especially merchants coming into Esfahan from India. The India trade was extremely important, especially for Chinese silks and other commodities uh, being produced in India. But for all of the Persian Gulf, we also had uh, communities of merchants. Uh, all of the, the Dutch and then English came, but also French were there in some uh, force, and even Danes and Swedes in these uh, centuries interacted in this town and had their own establishments for securing uh, international trade, which was increasingly moving toward Europe. If you take a car and you put it outside of the urban context, you have a caravanserai. And see, so these are two caravanserais. Um, this is in central Iran. This is near Bistatun, uh, which I took a picture of, and it's still functioning to some extent. And you, you have then the enclosed area, the very nice uh, sitting hall, and uh, then uh, establishments, again, for secure uh, merchandise en route. These uh, establishments would have lined the various roads, linking here there are cities within Iran, but also caravanserais are characteristic throughout the Middle East, from uh, Turkey into uh, Palestine. Uh, Katya Citrine Silverman, who was with us last year, uh, did, just published her study of, um, she's now teaching at Hebrew University, and she actually did a wonderful book on the caravans horizon from Palestine into Turkey. It's a, it's a marvelous study of these medieval establishments. And finally, then, if you look back at cities, and for instance, here Cairo, uh, and here in Upper Egypt, you have uh, also in Egypt, these mer merchants' houses, these, these establishments. Um, this one, a very nice one with a wooden rental. This is getting to the end of the, the Ottoman period, relatively recent here one, which is still in operation. And what you have in these uh, uh, 
places, are places for people to stay. The caravansary is somewhat like a motel, there, but these are more like uh, fundoks, which were really the, uh, the fundok or bakala is thought of as a uh, hotel now, but in point of fact, before it became a hotel, it was actually a place where merchants and visitors would stay. So these buildings are extremely important and show the continuity. Uh, and then this is just before the modern era, and as you can see, the buildings are still being utilized. And I think of the model then for cities and establishments for trade within modern towns. I'd like to end up with these uh, modern silks. That is, the inside on the left is from Qatar. It's a very luxurious set of um, uh, places where one can purchase anything from cars to watches to radios, etc. But uh, this other uh, establishment is uh, um, in Dubai. And when I saw this photograph, I did a double take because it is identical. The architecture, uh, the cr more or less the crowds, etc. Uh, in uh, Western Jerusalem, there's a place called Marka, which, which has an identical shopping mall. And so we have the Western shopping mall it has a continuity of the Hans, perhaps, and places where people can uh, uh, trade and purchase, a uh, retail uh, marketing, and obviously part of the aspect of global economies of this day. Thank you very much. <laughs>